This is the Empower Podcast. Released February 21st, 2021. Episode 531. Footprints and Symbols with Natasha Baker. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Natasha Baker of Snappy DA. Hey, Natasha. How are you? I'm doing great, Chris. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. I'm excited to talk about parts and footprints and just all the all the nitty gritty of you know getting stuff into a design that, that it seems like Snappy DA is, is really good at these days. Awesome. Me too. So let's get a little story about, I mean, so what what is your background and how, how did you find your way to starting Snappy DA? So uh, I'm an electrical engineer and uh, I studied at the university in Toronto. And after I graduated, I started working at uh, National Instruments and they actually create um, an electronic design tool. So I was actually doing my internship there before I graduated, um, but then I also uh, joined them in the research and development department. Um, So, you know, the very first thing I did actually while I was an intern was implement IPC compliance into their footprint database. Uh, so I read through all of the IPC specs and just kind of learned all the nitty gritties, all that exciting stuff. I mean, what you were dreaming of in, in engineering school, I'm sure, right? Absolutely. You know, I thought it was fascinating. I mean, yeah? just the level of detail that they put into, into this whole process. Uh, so yeah. What is in an IPC spec for people who haven't read it before, who haven't sat down with a, a you know, a, a coffee or, a, I don't know, amphetamines to stay awake? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, is, what is in there and like, and what do you then draw out of it? It's basically a standardization body, the IPC, and they have standards for, you know, all kinds of stuff. The ones that I was going through and then the ones that we're particularly interested in with parts libraries are, you know, the IPC 7351, that's for surface mount Uh, components and manufacturing. And basically it lays out kind of all of the best practices for soldering and for making sure that you have good manufacturing when you go to manufacture your boards. Mm. So they define the land patterns, all the land pattern standards. And so they have gone into, you know, a lot of depth in terms of the pad sizings and all of the different details that, you know, that you need to follow for good, good and reliable manufacturing. Yeah, that's great. And that and that's so you're saying that's actually at the going to KiCad. Well, I'm just going to use KiCad the whole time, so we'll just assume that here. <laughs> There's no no surprise there. But going into KiCad making a footprint, it's like best so like I I shouldn't oversize, I shouldn't undersize a pad and because of X Y and Z that might happen as a result of not following it. Is that kind of the thought there? Yeah, well they actually specify they actually specify different density levels. So mm, depending okay. on the type of design that you're doing, right? If you're doing a you know, a mobile device, right? Obviously things need to be very dense and you're probably going to be sizing the pad smaller, right? Than if you're building electronics for some, you know, rugged industrial high power application, right? Mm -hmm. So they specify most nominal and least, you know, most being obviously on the larger side and then least being obviously on the denser side. And yeah, and they specify basically different calculations and, you know, different sizing depending on the type of application that you're doing. So does that change your, I mean, obviously devices are getting more dense over time. Does that least specification then change from year to year, like a 2015 spec versus a 2021 spec? You know, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm actually not sure. I know that they're coming out with the IPC 7351C right now. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. I'd actually have to look into that myself <laughs> or ask our engineers. Yeah, yeah, that's I, I, I generally curious. I don't I don't expect uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> the latest and greatest on IPC. It, it's really interesting that I mean like this body of, that that does this too. I mean, it's obviously it's like a consortium or something like that, but who's on the other end of that? That just seems like boy, that's got to mm-hmm. be a dry a dry meeting meeting group, you know. <laughs> There's actually brilliant engineers that are part of it. Um, I know that one of our engineers, she participates in some of the meetings. And what's great about it is that anyone in the industry can participate. So they, so there's definitely members where, you know, you have to have your corporate sponsorship to be a part of the committee. 
But the great thing about it is that as far as I as far as I know, like anyone can get involved and participate. And the people that are working on it are just so it, it's inc- actually incredible the depth of knowledge that they have. Yeah. The depth of knowledge that they have around components and around manufacturing is absolutely like incredible. Like actually one person that comes to mind for me, I don't know if he wants me to mention him, but like he works at like Mentor Graphics, for example, and he mm, yeah has been working a lot on like the standardization of, you know, component naming and things like that. And, you know, just a brilliant engineer who the amount of depth of knowledge he has about components is it's like mind blowing. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. When you think about like the aggregated number of years, just how big the industry is times how many engineers are involved and just, yeah, then the length of time that the industry has been around, there's Mm -hmm. (laughs) many, many millennia of uh, person years, I would imagine (laughs) that are just aggregated. Absolutely. And the people on this, you know, on this committee, like they've been working on this for decades. So they are like they, the amount of knowledge that they have, it's just, it's amazing. And I've, I've been to some of these meetings. Um, I actually spoke at one of the meetings Hmm. and I, you know, it's just the comments that you hear afterwards about the best practices around manufacturing and just like, like, you know, I'm just thinking of one idea off the top of my head where there was this this woman who came up to me afterwards and she's been, you know, in the industry decades, right? So of course she has this knowledge, but we were talking about QFP components that have like a thermal pad in the middle. Okay. Yep. And so the IPC recommends breaking that into chunks, right? So that you don't get a floating component, right? On top of your board. And so, but what what she was telling us was that actually what they do is they actually put like an X of solder mask and solder paste in the middle of the component. That's cool. Yeah, but it's like, these are like the types of insights that you only get from like having done it. You know, they're not in any guidebook. Right. It's almost like formalizing tribal knowledge at that point, right? There's probably someone who tried that, cutting out a stencil specifically to solve some problem locally. And then they're like, oh, well, this could be a a more broadly available best practice. Exactly. Yeah. And there's, there's just such a wealth of knowledge there. I would definitely recommend like... To, to check it out and, you know, see how you can get involved because the amount of knowledge that's there is, is really incredible. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Okay. So, well, you, so you're at NIA, you're doing this, but you must have turned around and then said, you must have looked at the industry and been disappointed. I mean, obviously you, you started Snap EDA. So, so what was, what was the step from NI and reading IPC docs up towards actually starting this, this company? Yeah. So, so actually I was working in R and D for a couple of years and, you know, loved it, but I always had this like sense of like, I want to see what, you know, marketing is like, I want to see what like the business side is like. And, and so I moved over to market, the marketing side, but while I was there, I was still, it was a, a technical marketing role. So I was still designing circuit boards and things like that for trade shows. And there was this, you know, one design that I was working on and it was basically a circuit board that we were going to put into a Wii steering wheel to make a cool demo at a trade show where you could like, you know, drive, (laughs) you know, the Wii steering wheel and control this like Nintendo emulator on the computer. Yeah. And so it's a really simple design and it was a simple Texas Instruments reference design. And as I started designing this simple accelerometer board from a very simple reference design, what I realized was that all of these super, you know, basic components that I needed weren't in the library of my PCB design tool. You know, so super simple, common voltage regulators, like they just weren't there. And I had to design them from scratch. So this board that should have taken me maybe a few hours, right, to 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 create, ended up taking me like days of time because I had to create all of the symbols and footprints from scratch. Right. You know, I actually remember I was at my grandparents' house and I just remember like I was there and I wanted to spend time with them, but like <laughs> I was so focused on getting this board done yeah. and like I was making all the symbols and footprints. And it was kind of like in that moment where I was just like, you know, this isn't like, why why can't elect- electrical engineers have the same, you know, types of libraries and resources accessible that are available to, to consumers, to software engineers? Like, why can't electrical engineers have all of this ready-to-use content when they're designing? And it, it's not just about symbols and footprints, right? I mean, symbols and foot- footprints are just the most obvious thing. But Mm -hmm. a lot of people are simulating. They can't find simulation models. And when they find them, they don't know what are the limitations of that model, right? Because that's the other, that's the other challenge that I was seeing is I would go to simulate and well, you know, at what frequency is the spice model actually valid? Mm -hmm. And like, you, you know, as an engineer, you know, as you're using these models, you don't know that, right? And so what would happen is a lot of the time, 
engineers would simulate something at a frequency that just it was not modeled at. And then they'd be like, oh, something's wrong with my design or, oh, something's wrong with this tool. But it's like, no, they just don't have insight into the limitations of these macro models Mm -hmm. when it comes to spice. So the whole idea behind Snap EDA is really not just about access. I mean, access is great. And I think that's step one is, you know, providing a centralized place where engineers can, can get this content. But I think the biggest question is like, well, you know, how do you know you can trust it once you find it? <laughs> and that's... Yeah, that's a great one. That's the place we really focus. I think to, to take a quick step back, I mean, the inclination you had about the, you know, why aren't there libraries out there? Why, why do I have to keep doing the same thing that everybody else has done? That sounds very familiar. I've said that. I know other people have said that. We've just been mm-hmm. grumbling about it for, I mean, we grumbled about, grumbled about it in the Amp Hour for many years as well. I don't know as many people that went out and tried to fix it though. So that's the piece that I'm interested in. Like you actually like, you're like, oh yeah, no, I could fix this. So that, that part's pretty cool. So what was then the jump into, into doing that to take that first step? Yes, Chris, you bring up a very good point. You have to have a little, a little bit of craziness in you to go after this. <laughs> this I'm going to say gumption, Natasha. I, I think that's gumption. gumption. That's, you know, yeah. have you read uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? That's right. Yeah, I love that book. Yeah. Oh, I love that book too. So yeah, they talk about gumption. You know, I read that actually in university, actually at the same time, or not in, yeah, in university at the same time I was doing my internship and at uh-huh. the same time that I was actually, um, I was doing some contract work for analog devices as well. Oh, cool. Helping them with libraries, right? And so, and yeah. I was reading Zen and the Art of Mot- Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh-huh. I loved that concept of gumption. Yep. And I think that comes back to the trust point, right? Which is if you can have, if you look at anything with a sense of craftsmanship, right? Then like everything becomes so rewarding. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I think sometimes people think of libraries as an afterthought. They think of them as like, oh, they're just the libraries. Right, right. Well, and it and it, sh- it should be right, but it's, you know, and it should be something I can mm-hmm. trust and it should be this thing that a CAD tool has or whatever, but it's just, there's a ton of work there. I mean, that's, that's what I've learned. <laughs> and I, I, obviously you have as well. I mean, that, that sounds like that's your exact experience. Yeah. Each library, like, I think that people think, oh, it's just a library, but what, the, and oh, an intern can do that, you know, but what they don't realize <laughs> is that for some of the, like for a lot of these models, yeah. especially the electromechanical models, First yeah. of all, you need to be really skilled to read those data sheets sometimes. Like mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. like these are complex mechanical models. Yeah. And even understanding all the nuances of your tool and to create proper slotted holes, understanding like the plating, you know, being able to interpret a plated or non-plated hole. Like there's just so many details that mm-hmm. are so not only easy to overlook, but that take time to understand and yeah. to take time and take a lot of expertise and you know, at Snappy Day, we, we don't think of it as just, this is a library. We think of like each library we create as like something that we do put, you know, that gumption into and that craftsmanship. Mm. But anyway, I digress a little bit here. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> From That's your main great. question, um, which is about the... Just like the genesis of it. Yeah, the genesis. I mean, so, yeah. so actually taking that leap then is is a big one. I mean, and yeah. I'm going to I'm going to be completely honest. I was a bit skeptical. I first learned about Snap EDA not right at the beginning, but relatively early I saw it and I was just mm-hmm. like, "Oh, well, would I use something like that? I don't mm-hmm. know if I would." But over time, I guess one thing that inspired me to reach out to you is like I was going back to Snap Snap EDA and requesting models multiple times and I was like, "Oh, I know Natasha, I should have her on the show. Like I, you and I have talked when I was out in San Francisco a bunch and like, I think it's a great product. I, I honestly hadn't found myself using it until recently. And now that I have, I mean, obviously anyone has that light bulb moment. It's just like part of my workflow now. And that's really cool. I think that's really a great thing. Wow. That's awesome to hear, Chris. Cause I mean, that, that comes like, that means a lot coming from you just being that I know you, I know, like, I know how discerning you are <laughs> with the tools that you use. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I listen to your show <laughs> and how, you know, so that, that does mean a lot. And, you know, I think that, so first of all, you're absolutely right. When I was getting started, getting started was so hard because everyone I would talk to would say, you know, this sounds really cool, but I, I wouldn't use it because right. my company has a librarian. Or right. Exactly. Yeah. Making libraries is part of my job or mm-hmm. I would never trust a third party for that. Like those are the Mm -hmm. things I heard over and over again. And I can't tell you like how demoralizing it was (laughs) like in the early days, because I felt like the world needs this, the world needs this product, but it 
like just kind of facing that every day, day in and day out. And then on top of that, you know, going out into the local startup community was very challenging as well because no one knew what I was talking about. They would be like, well, what are footprints? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what are symbols? Like, well, so- let's let's start with PCBs and uh, you just like <laughs> plop the IPC spec down on the desk. You're like, read this and get back to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Totally, totally. It was so it was definitely really challenging, but yeah, I believed in it. So what I did is I just said to myself, you know what, like, I'm just gonna build this, like, Mm. maybe the world's not ready for it yet. But I'm gonna build it. And so what I did is I quit my job, even though I loved my job. And I thought it was great. But I was like, if I don't do this now, I'm never gonna do it. So I quit my job, I didn't have a ton of savings, but I had enough to just kind of start coding. And Mm -hmm. I didn't, I actually didn't know how to do any web coding. Like, obviously I studied engineering. So, you know, you do the basic programming classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know how to go figure things out that, that parts, you know, you can, you can figure it out over enough time, but do you want to spend that time and do you have the runway to do that sort of thing? Exactly. But like, I just, I just spent that time. (laughs) I just spent that time. I mean, I had the luxury of time then. I didn't have funding. I didn't have a team. I didn't have like a job anymore. (laughs) Yeah. So I had kind of the luxury of time to just learn how to code. And I figured it was a good investment, right? I, I was yeah, very young right. young at the time, relative relative to now, obviously. And so I just started coding. And actually, funny enough, the, the same code base that was like the code base that I started learning on, which was this Django like tutorial for a like a bookstore, a bookstore mm-hmm. app, like book management. That's sure. actually yeah. like that same Django application is like, what our current code base is built on today. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that's, it's like still the same, our database. It's got stand power. Yeah, that's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, it's interesting too, like the the book, I mean, classification and that sort of thing, it does actually make sense as a as a starter template too, because you're, you're I think there are very hard categories that you're going to, things are, the different parts are going to slot into. So it does seem to kind of fit that model pretty well. Is there, have you formulated a, a, a Snap EDA Dewey Decimal System or similar? The Django based system is like is like a bookstore. That actually seems to make sense, like having really hard categories for parts as well. It seems to fit fit that same model pretty well. Totally. Yeah. And like the tutorial, it, it really does. It, it's kind of funny because like there's certain database fields, even mm-hmm. today, that are based on that original, you know, that original tutorial. So for example, for component images, we use cover art, book cover art. Oh nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's great. Name. And we yeah. just haven't changed it, but I mean, it's it's changed so much over the years, and and thank thankfully much better and uh, software engineers than than myself have kind of continued evolving it. But anyway, yeah, that was kind of the the genesis. I just you know I just sat down and started coding and started talking to people, kind of you know different engineers who were willing to talk to me, give me their feedback, and and again, a lot of them were saying, yeah, I would love to use it. It sounds cool, but I wouldn't use it. You know, they were very honest with me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would think one thing that's really tough about it too is just the network effect type of thing where mm-hmm. you, I mean, so now on, on the front page of Snap EDA, you talk about having, you know, over a million parts or mm-hmm. sorry, a million engineers rather, and many, many parts that are available are, are mm-hmm. right out of the gate. I, mm-hmm. I'd imagine at the beginning, it's tough because you just, you're starting from zero and you have to actually go and build these models that are used over and over again. Each time you get a new one, you benefit from it because it grows the the centralized database, but it's, it starts at zero. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, you know, yeah, building a library with millions of components was definitely like, you know, looking back on it, knowing what I know now, <laughs> yeah. I think I had the uh, enthusiasm on my side. But, you know, it took us a long time. And for a long yeah. time, we, you know, we just didn't have a lot of components. So what we did is we started, well, I can go into that after, but we started offering sure. things like free requests right from mm. the beginning. And, yeah. And that was kind of like a way to bootstrap our database. We allowed engineers to upload components. We had user-generated content, which we didn't want to have, but it was just kind of the easiest way to get started. That was like the only way to get started is we allowed people to upload their models to to our community. Were they actually doing it? Was it IPC compliant? (laughs) (laughs) Definitely not IPC compliant. (laughs) And, and, you know, we had to come up with an algorithm to, you know, in terms of how to handle that, right? To make sure that we always deranked user-generated content. So today Uh, you don't find a lot of that just because we always prioritize supplier or snap EDA generated content. And we give kind of a big warning if something's user-generated. But, you know, the reality is, is, you know, with there being millions and millions of parts out there, you know, actually, I think IHS says there's a billion parts you know, that have a million 
a billion. IHS, those those <laughs> folks, I don't know. That's So this is a clearinghouse of data for components. I used to do a little bit with IHS stuff, but like, yeah, they, a billion. I mean, like, I, I just feel like there's, that's, that's such a big number. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, but a lot, you know, a lot of these uh, connector companies, especially they build uh, yeah. so many of their components on the fly, right? They're yeah, all right, made right. to order and there's so many different permutations of, you know, different combinations and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it may not be like, I don't think it's, I don't think it's an impossible number. Like knowing what I know about some of these connector companies. Uh huh. Specifically connectors, you're saying, huh? Specifically connectors. I, there's just so many, like you mm-hmm. know, potential permutations of of connectors. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The part the part numbers are horrendous sometimes. I feel like connectors and crystal companies. I feel like crystal companies have the worst part numbering scheme I've ever I've ever had to deal with. I don't know. Like it's <laughs> again maybe because it's made to order type of stuff, but it's just like and they always put spaces in there, which are just like, what are you guys doing? It just seems like such a so so out of the norm from the other the other types of components that I'm normally using. Yeah, well, you know, with some of these companies that are doing all the acquisitions, right? Of mm-hmm. you know, well, all these semiconductor companies, all these sure, component yeah. manufacturers acquiring yeah. so many different departments. I mean, there's no standardization for for so many of these companies, right? Once they've acquired mm-hmm. all these different groups, they all use these different naming conventions. Don't even get me started on naming conventions. You know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I all go right. on forever. <laughs> Well, let's get to something that's not uh, not controversial at all. Let's talk about be- being a startup. Uh, <laughs> it's not like there's mm-hmm. a there's a you know HBO documentary about it. So you joined uh, Y Combinator, and that's where Snap mm-hmm. EDA kind of got got its uh, official start. What what was that like? Mm-hmm. I think we've had a couple other companies from from Y Combinator on here, but what was that like for you and Snap EDA? You know, Y Combinator was honestly the best thing that could have happened to Snap EDA. I think that, you know, because between the time that I started the company and the time that we got into Y Combinator, mm-hmm. I started with, you know, just kind of building this thing, you know, from first principles. We didn't have any funding. And uh, and because we didn't have any funding, I was working on other projects, right? Mm-hmm. I Well, I had to. I had to have an income. Yeah. So I was writing for Reuters. I was writing for Forbes. I was you know, writing for, you know, all kinds of clients and even doing coding yep, for different companies. Uh, yep. And what Y Combinator did is, you know, I always knew I wanted to do Snappy Day full time, right? It wasn't a question in my mind. It was just a matter of resources. Mm, yeah. And what was so great about Y Combinator is, you know, obviously first and foremost, it's, you know, having a little bit of funding, but I think the, you know, and that was what was most important at the time was that I could actually focus on this full time. Yeah. But, you know, ultimately the biggest benefit is, just the people that you are able to surround yourself with that, you know, go through Y Combinator. They're, they're all people that are like-minded. They're all very driven to seeing their company succeed. They have, you know, ideas that they want to build. They're determined. I think that that is ultimately the best thing. And I think for, I think for me as like a founder, it was kind of like the inflection point between, you know, just being an engineer coding this on my own and just trying to get it off the ground to, you know, thinking more about, okay, like, how do I make this bigger than just building the product? And, you know, thinking about how do we, how do we grow it faster? Yeah, I would absolutely, I would highly recommend Y Combinator to anyone who is considering it. And, you know, any, any companies that are doing, you know, yeah, I I would definitely recommend it. I don't know, Chris, I'm curious, like, what have you heard from other people who've been on your, on your show? Well, so we uh, we had Luke Eisman, who was the hardware person at Y Combinator, I believe, right about the time you were you were joining. Is that right? Yes, yes, he was there. Right, yeah, he was there when I was there. Uh, so Luke's been on the show. It's interesting hearing you know their take on hardware. I think Upverter was also in through went through Y Combinator. So I think those are the two that we have had on the show. My take on it is, I, I'm curious specifically around the, the hardware aspect of just like how how they handled it because it it does you know like seeing the companies that came out of y combinator it's very software e in terms of like the even the mm-hmm. end product type of stuff like, like they're very traditional consumer type things whereas it seems like you're more you know b2b and, and serving engineers so i think that's 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 curious to me and i would yeah. be curious to hear about how they how they treated thing obviously the the website of things obviously it is snap eda is a great website and mm-hmm. there's web technologies in the back end so that all makes sense and octopart octopart went through y combinator as well oh octopart as well that's right yeah right and so that's probably one of the closest ones because yeah. of the the component tie-in and stuff like that well i mean what what was the take there i mean was it was it 
Has, has there been similar hardware stuff since or hardware adjacent type stuff since? First of all, what I would say is that, you know, Y Combinator definitely has that reputation being where they started from of being more focused on consumer and mm -hmm. webby kind of stuff. But the reality is, is that the types of companies that they've been funding mm -hmm. in the last few years, like they funded like some really, really interesting hardware companies. I'm talking about rocket startups, satellite companies, mm -hmm. like airplane, <laughs> like there's mm -hmm. the company that's building the supersonic airplanes. Like I think that people don't realize, you know, and I'd, I'd say especially uh, yeah, like yeah. the past three to five years, there's actually been, if anything, from what, what I can see is that I do see, I mean, and I guess I, I'm also looking for those types of companies, right? I, I tend to notice those companies. Sure. Yeah. Right. You want to, you, you want to talk to them. You want to <laughs> talk to their engineers, I'm sure. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I would definitely say like, there's a lot of really yeah. interesting companies in that area. So if anything, I think that now there's kind of the, the critic, not criticism necessarily, but criticism of like people in VC in general, kind of mentioning that, oh, like there are, people aren't funding enough consumer stuff, right? Like with the whole clubhouse thing, they're talking about how that's like reviving investment in like cons the consumer space and in consumer apps. So if anything, I think there's like been a shift away from mm. investing in a lot of like consumer and just kind of like, yes, general SaaS for sure has always been popular. But yeah, I think more, more and more hard tech, like I think that people are definitely interested in more hard tech for sure. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, I can imagine from a trying to find funding and having the community, like you mentioned, you know, just dealing with a lot of the same issues, dealing with people in, you know, trying to put modern startup methodologies into more traditional industries. That has to be a really helpful thing in terms of how to like break through to different, yep. different groups. You know, I assume that you're <laughs> pretty regularly talking to grumpy old engineers or grumpy young engineers, to be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm probably the, <laughs> the younger persuasion and pretty grumpy. So, uh, yeah. 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 And actually that's a great point. Cause that's what I was also going to mention is that, you know, you don't go to Y Combinator for them to teach you about hardware, right? Like if you're going to Y Combinator for them to teach you about hardware, you're mm -hmm. doing it wrong. <laughs> like, I mean, that's not, that should not be the expectation at all. And yeah. and of course, there's obviously some aspects of like scaling a hardware startup that they can definitely help you with. Like the person that's in charge of the hardware side now, I believe is Eric from Pebble. Oh, uh, Mikofsky or however you say his last name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to try to mispronounce his, mm -hmm. uh, his last name, but yes, he's in charge of hardware now. And like, you know, he has so much experience with scaling up hard a hardware company, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, if you're looking for that, I think that, you know, Y Combinator is a great fit and also for all of the other benefits around scaling your company and business models and things like that. But I think if you're going to Y Combinator with the ex expectation of helping you with the actual hardware, right, like I think right. they can connect you with people. I think you can meet other people, but like, you know, I think, you know, you have to recognize like, what is the value there? And I think the value there is really around, they're going to help you with the best practices of like startup -y stuff, right? Like yeah. understanding the startup ecosystem, how to, you know, build a company in a way that maximizes the, you know, the understanding of the customer pain points. Yeah. So it's just kind of a different, you know, you just have to go into, you know, go into it with the understanding that you're not going for necessarily hardware expertise. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't sound like you were looking for that. You were looking more for that methodology and that uh, the website. I mean, it is a web service company that's serving a particular set of grumpy engineers, and that's it's just hard. <laughs> it's hardware adjacent, but it's not hardware itself. So that that helps a lot. Yeah, totally. Well, I am a hardware grumpy engineer. What would you What would you normally ask when you were you know? So you're starting to do these. I assume you're doing interviews and you know just talking to engineers. What were the kind of things that you got into, and what, what were some of the insights you learned when you were talking to engineers about their their part habits? Yeah, we you know, we talk to engineers all the time these days still. But you know, I think the biggest thing was just I think the biggest thing was trust, right? Like I think it was that engineers recognized that when they use third-party libraries, they might spend just as much time verifying the component yeah, yep. as they spend creating it. Yep. I think that was definitely like a, you know, obviously a an interesting point, right? Which is that it's not just enough to provide components. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You'd always just, you could just have a, like a GitHub repo that has like, you know, a bunch of, you know, just like, oh, here's some zip files. Good luck. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, or just exactly. But like, that's the thing is that that's something that I think, unless you're from our industry, unless you're an engineer, it's a very like nuanced point because yeah. they don't recognize 
how important that is, how yeah. important that sense of trust is. Yeah, I always said like it's it's hard for me to, you know, when I was working at a big company, it was hard it would have been hard for me to say, "Hey, I downloaded this thing from the internet, and by the way, our prototype is late because I found this footprint somewhere and I didn't check it." Mm -hmm. Versus even even if it's still wrong, it's like I can at least take the responsibility and say, "Hey, I Chris mess this up. Yes, I'm responsible. Yes, I will fix it. And it wasn't like a, it wasn't a laziness on my part or not checking it or whatever. It was, I just made a mistake and, you know, mistakes happen. And so I think mm -hmm. the, for, in my mind, the, the mental switch has to be like, it has to be so reliable and so, uh, such a, an obvious choice that like I would, you know, and so I'm still going to check it, but I, but I start from there, right? That part becomes part of my workflow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So that was, that was definitely one of the the points. And we spent a lot of time on that, you know, cause we're not going to like, you know, you can go to GitHub, you can upload everything on GitHub, right? All your libraries and things like that. And you can find them on GitHub. And there's lots of places on the web where you can find content and crowdsource it. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think what's unique about the electronics industry is that there are all these nuanced aspects that engineers need to understand about the component. We talked about IPC have different, having different density levels. So which density level does this component follow? Mm -hmm. Does it follow the data sheet recommendations? Does it follow, you know, IPC recommendations? Uh, so I think that is the first point that we learned. I think another point is that there are so many preferences <laughs> with libraries. It is yeah. absolutely nuts. There's also not full, like, yes, we talked about how the IPC has standards around manufacturability, but they don't define standards for everything. Mm. They don't define standards for things like the, the pin one indicator or mm. the line widths of your silk screen and things like that. Right. So, you know, we have like, you know, some engineers who have specific desires for how big the pin one indicator size is, whereas other people don't care. So that's the other thing we learned is that what we're doing is very preference-based. Uh, another example is our, in our an annual survey this year, we asked engineers, how do you like your symbols built? Do you like them, you know, in a logical flow with kind of like, you know, the inputs on the left, the outputs on the right, mm -hmm. power on the top and bottom? Mm -hmm. Or do you kind of like it, you know, kind of like the data sheet application, application circuit? You know, they usually have a an example, you know, schematic symbol there. Yeah, like a, a best fit to, so that the inductor has a short lead between, you know, switch switching pin and feedback pin or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so we asked them that, right? And that's another example where like, it was like completely split down the middle and <laughs> like, oh, which great. actually really surprised me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, great. What do we do? So surveys are frustrating that way where it's like, oh yeah, people, people like things. That's what we've learned. <laughs> <laughs> and which is great. And so what we've realized is that like, what we need to do is we need to be flexible, right? So we've architected our system to enable that flexibility in preferences. And we have started allowing people to customize their symbols more. So one example is in KiCad correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the key cat expert here. Just say you have like, I don't know, a no connect pin, mm -hmm. right? And just say they're like, there's like four of them. Or maybe like a better example is probably like multiple ground pins. Sure. Yep. So uh, in KeyCAD, you can't have a pin named the same thing. You can have the same name, but it, it has to have a unique number. So like if it's pins like 287 or 28, 15 and 16, you have to have you, you can you have to have individual pins for each, but you can actually stack them on top of one another and it'll connect as though it's right. one. Uh, I find that very okay. very confusing personally though, if that's if that's where we're going. <laughs> yeah, so that's and and that's the difference. So there's yeah. some people that like them stacked mm -hmm. and overlapped. Yeah. When yep. they're multiple ground pins, right? right? They say, Yeah, ground's connected, I am good, and they don't want to draw all the individual lines. Yes, exactly. But then there's some people that want them expanded because they want all the individual lines they want to like customize e or they want to like, they want to like control each net individually. Yep. Yep. So because of that, we now have a feature that allows engineers to expand that ground pin, right. And to show all the pins. Mm -hmm. So that way they can kind of customize it to their needs. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> so that's the other, that was like the other main learning. Right. And so, yeah, we're working on some other ways of kind of further customizing the symbols and yeah. based on that. That's great. And actually, that's a good lead into the fact that this is a centralized database. So obviously, Snap EDA owns the IP, owns the knowledge of what's hooked to what. It is in some meta in-between format. But then if someone, if I go to, if I go to the, you know, the, let's see, I'm on the page right now. If I go to the TSC 101 BILT uh, current sense amplifier page, I can go and download that part. For KiCad, someone else can go and click the 
this different button on the same page and get the Altium part, the Eagle part, or the whatever part. So it actually re-exports mm -hmm. it uh, from some meta format. So what does that look like on the inside? Yeah, so we create everything in basically a neutral format that we then can convert to all the different file formats. So we've created export uh, exporters for every single PCB design format that we support, which you know has its own challenges because there's different ways of defining different elements in every tool. Slotted holes in particular are quite challenging just because there's mm. different ways of doing that. And in some cases, there's there's actually no way to create slotted holes in some PCB design tools. So we have oh. to you know, figure out the best practices in every tool. Yeah. I believe in Eagle, for example, we need to use the milling, you know, the milling layer because there isn't like an actual slotted hole huh. element yeah. that there is in other formats. And I think even in KiCad, I think it was relatively recent that they introduced the slotted hole shapes. Yeah, if exactly. I, remember. I think that's right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So you just have to deal with all the messiness of all these different CAD programs and all their own quirks on each individual level. Yeah, but you know, our our goal with each exporter is to make it native like, right? So to get it as native as possible, that is what we've been spending a lot of time on is making sure that when you download the keycad symbol or when you download the alt team symbol, it looks as native like as possible. Yeah. And yeah, like we want to make sure that it looks it totally conforms to your, you know, to your circuit board design. Yeah. When you download it. One thing I'm really excited about, so like the V6 KiCad stuff is all of the symbol, right now all the footprints, even in V5, all the footprints are atomic. So you could basically get get a SOT23-5 and a SOT23 and basically download that footprint and it just kind of sits there. But that was a mess for the symbols. And now in V6, it's going to do that. And I think that's actually going to play really well into the Snap EDA like workflow. Now it's like I go and download TSC101 or whatever the part is, and it's there's a downloaded symbol, there's a downloaded footprint, and it's not like I'm downloading a symbol library like I have to now. So that's actually going to be a great change, I think. Hmm. Interesting. So how is it? How is it like now then? Like what? Sorry, what's the change? It's going to be. Yeah, yeah. So right now, when I download, so if I go to the TSC101 page and I download the KiCad version of the footprint and I download the KiCad version of the symbol, the symbol is actually importing a what it what KiCad interprets as a entire library. So you could actually stack 50 different components into that symbol library instead of that one file oh. being just specific to that one symbol. Right, right. So now that's changing yes. in, in a good way. I think It's going to be a messy change, I think, to V6, but I think it's going to fit really well here because, like I said, I, mm -hmm. I want to go and download all these individual things. The export already works like that. But what, what it ends up mm -hmm. as is right now with V5, I go download 20 different parts on Snap EDA. It's effectively like I'm importing 20 libraries instead of 20 individual symbols, but it's just reusing. It's the only way to do it, really. So it it, it works, but it's it's going to get better. So <laughs> well, actually, and and that's and that's interesting. But also, I don't know if you're aware, but you can also batch export a library, a oh, keycad cool. library okay. from our site. Yeah. So I didn't just know that. FYI. Okay. And then it, it consolidates it all into one library. Yeah. So pro that's tip. great. Yeah, that's great. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> Oh, one more thing is if you use our plugin, you can save it to the same library. So just another pro tip, if you want to add like five different parts, you know, you want to download five different parts. If you use the pl our KiCad plugin, you can save them all to the same library as far as I know. Mm, okay. Have you, I don't know if you've tried that or not, but just another pro tip. I mean, I'm usually doing onesie twosie type things too. I mean, like, I'll be honest, I, you know, I use Snap EDA for like the fancy parts. Mm-hmm. So recently I requested a part build that was like a weird 3D model and uh, I don't think the vendor one was available and the footprint wasn't available. And I'm like, oh, 50 bucks, that's like totally worth the hour I would spend on this and just getting it looking good. And like, you know, so then it looks good for my client. I it, I can check the footprint, which was kind of weird too, against the the data sheet. And it's just like, check it, good, go, fine. You know, like that that to me is actually like very valuable. So that that's a recent recent use case mm -hmm. so, awesome yeah where do you see all this going i mean like so obviously it's growing by the day it's 25 million parts i was reading the engineer number before so it says in the little search bar 25 million parts how uh, how much bigger are we getting here so i think in terms of what's next for us i mean definitely we still have to grow our coverage i mean there's just i feel like we haven't even scratched the surface of our vision mm. right i mean yes we have symbols footprints 3d models and we want to continue growing our coverage we want to continue supporting more tools and supporting more preferences, right? So that's definitely in the short term. We've only just gotten started with where we want to go in terms of helping engineers with content, right? So we've started adding simulation models, so SPICE and IBIS models. 
And, you know, I definitely see uh, see us continuing to build out our coverage there. I have a lot of really like, I'm just really excited about that space. Honestly, I feel like there's lots of really interesting things that can be done there. We are also starting to introduce other, you know, larger building blocks, you yeah, could say, yeah. like reference designs. Yeah, like sub-circuits, sim- similar type of things, right? Yeah, there's that whole area. So, and I think, and again, I think that like, that's kind of only the start of kind of our larger vision. <laughs> I think where we want to go in the long run is really, you know, we want to just, the way I look at it is like, the EDA tools are so good at creating the tools, right? And I think that they're doing a fantastic job. And I think in some cases, we're seeing even like greater innovation in other areas as well. But like in general, it's like, they do a great job creating the tools. But I feel like what's missing is how do we make it easy for engineers? Like, how do we make it easy for them to use those tools? How do we break down barriers in those tools themselves? You know, I think that like, you know, I think a big part of that is content, but it's it's also tying the whole kind of design flow together. So when we look at how engineers are designing and, you know, how they're making design decisions and, you know, when they're placing down components, like, do they need to place down decoupling caps? Like, I think there's all these decisions that engineers are making mm-hmm. yeah. that- Like micro decisions. Micro decisions that a company like ours can help to break down barriers for engineers to make those decisions easier using data, right? At this point, we've collected so much data. And by the way, we don't, you know, we don't release any of this data publicly. It's all obviously anonymous, but we've released, we've collected a lot of data about like, okay, like what components are engineers using and, you know, what other types of components are they downloading with those components? And I think that where we're going next is really how do we help engineers to make their designs just like flow a lot more smoothly by helping them while they're designing proactively. Yeah. So I think that like, we're going to move away from just being just a database towards how can we be a proactive, like almost like an applications engineer. Yeah. Right. Yep. An applications engineer who's helping you, who's like there with you and like, (laughs) who's just kind of like helping you as you're designing. And I think that like, we're not that far away from that because this is what we're doing right now is really the hard part, right? The hard part is really creating all this content because again, there's so much of it. It's challenging to automate. There's so many preferences but I think once we're there, I think that, you know, all of a sudden we can start leveraging that and giving people like intelligent recommendations that help them design a lot faster, a lot better. Yeah. And that's where I think the value is. You know, I think the content's great. It helps people so much and people love it, right? Like they need it. They love it. They recognize now that like a lot of them don't want to go back, right? right. Like we talked yeah. at the beginning of this podcast about like when I first started, how people said they would never use this. But nowadays, especially the last three years, we're seeing this like shift, right? Where everyone's starting to use third-party libraries and it's just something changed. Like the world changed, the world's different. Yeah. And I feel like this is just the first step. I think that where we're going next is really the real value in the long run is helping engineers right when they're designing to make these micro decisions. And I love, I love that. I love that term micro decision. I think that's a, a perfect way to describe it. Well, I'm going to ask you to do something in, in that I want you to push back on all the vendors. Because <laughs> that's one of the problems here is that everything comes from a PDF in the first place, right? Everything is this lowest yep. common denominator. Engineering drawing is like, you can always pass a PDF around. You can always pass this other stuff. Like, why why isn't that happening? Why, why isn't there some mm-hmm. standardized digital format between a TI and an analog and an NXP and like, why are they all, can, can you go beat them up and get them in a room and just be like, <laughs> no, do it like this. I mean, like, how, how do we do that? That's what I want to know. That's, that's an awesome question. Something we definitely hear a lot. And uh, yeah, I would love to, I would love to do that. And you know, the, the good news is we do work very closely with suppliers. One thing that we believe in at Snappy DA is that we believe that when suppliers win, engineers win and vice versa. So we don't see like, I don't know if I agree. I don't know if I agree with that one. I feel like suppliers are all winning lately and I'm losing every time I go to order parts. (laughs) (laughs) I think they're changing. I think they're recognizing that they need to, I think they recognize that they need to help engineers if they want to win in the digital age. I guess there's so few of them these days, Natasha. I mean, it's just like, I don't know. They're just so big. Yeah, they're all consolidating, but uh, I, I get, I get, I get the the general feeling you're you're trying to convey, though. I mean, like, yeah, it, there, it's it's not like we're all fighting different battles here, but it's just like I f- I feel there's so much entrenched, there's so many old ways of doing things, 
and it's just very frustrating. Yeah, but it's changing. Well, that it's changing, Chris. Like, yeah, you, be positive. you're seeing like, it more than I am. I'm sure. I'm sure you are. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, like I'll say that there's like there's definitely glimmers of hope. Okay. Okay. There's there's chip companies that know what an API is and they know how to actually <laughs> implement oh, one and yeah. use one. Okay. No, great. Yeah, they are working on it. Like, great. and and you know, for a lot of these companies, it's multi year initiatives mm -hmm. because the way that things were or the way that things are today is that a lot of these companies grew from acquisitions, mm -hmm. as we were just saying, yeah. right? And so there's some business groups in these large semiconductor companies who are fantastic at collecting all the specs and data and like they have it available via spreadsheets or even an API, right? Some of the best chip companies and the best semiconductor companies and connector companies have APIs. Mm -hmm. But like the challenge that a lot of these companies have is that they don't have that data built up, right? So they're doing all of these, right. you know, big undertakings <laughs> right now that are multi-year projects to make their data available. So they've they've got it all in like in like a paper format and a filing cabinet somewhere, and they're they still haven't uh, they haven't moved into the digital age either. <laughs> if they even have that, wow. like you ask some of these companies, and they say like I don't even know where I would find that. I don't think we have it, wow. right? So, like you know, I think that like they do recognize it, and I think that there are kind of like there is kind of like I would say this like changing of the guard in terms of like this. I would say like a new generation of marketing type of people who are coming up, who are like, oh, it just makes sense to support engineers. Like we got to do this. <laughs> I've been like, I've been a big champion for this internally, you know, but they don't, it's like they're fighting their own yeah. battle, it's you like, know, what, internally. What, what were you guys doing before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like, I mean, the thing, I, I think we have to like, I don't know. I, I totally get your frustration, Chris. And it's good to hear that from you too, just hearing the engineer perspective, which we obviously hear a lot. But what I do want to tell engineers is just like, this, like there are really good people at these component suppliers, right? Who want to support engineers. Mm. Like they want to do that, but they're fighting their own kind of battles yeah. with the legacy data yeah. that's oh, available. Yeah, I believe it. I believe but it's it. changing. Yeah. Okay. It's changing and it's going to change. It's going to change. I am 100% sure about that. I mean, so do you have any ideas about how to then push on these companies in order to encourage that change more? Because one thing that I think about is some of my favorite vendors are the ones that are putting models on DigiKey and obviously Snap EDA mm -hmm. is now on DigiKey and like seeing like digital access like that, like that warms my heart. That makes me want to use their parts more. I feel like <laughs> that in itself is yeah. marketing, but I don't know how to get that mm -hmm. across. I can only, I'm only, you know, one engineer building however many few, however few products overall to the, the general market. And it just feels like it's not going to make a dent. So do you have any ideas on how to then push that back to them? aside from doing a podcast about it and hoping they listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say like definitely contacting any reps that you work with and letting them know. They are listening. Things do move a little bit slower at these bigger companies, but they are listening. Mm. If you work with a rep, definitely definitely let them know. Share it with distributors. I think the distributors are really educating the suppliers right now about the need for this content. Mm. So, you know, definitely reach out to the disties. Okay. That seems very slow to me. That seems, I, I, you know, I feel like I'm gonna start Tweet. putting on like, a, yeah, like start a revolution or something like that. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, I can tell you, like, I've been doing this for a while now, yeah, and I can definitely yeah. tell you, in the last couple of years, we're kind of pretty slammed constantly with supplier projects. Yeah. Oh, interesting. We have a, a large demand, so things are absolutely changing. Great. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're you're the you're the tip of the spear here. I mean, it's great. I mean, and I I hope it doesn't come across like I you know my vitriol is not pointed at Snap EDA. It's more general frustration at mm -hmm. the at the industry and companies like Snap EDA are actually helping. So that that part's great. Totally, and you know, I think it's just education, yeah. right? I think yeah. that the people that are in marketing sometimes don't understand. Maybe they haven't been PCB designers in the past, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So, and and those are the people that are typically pushing forward this content, right? Mm -hmm. It's either the applications team or the marketing team. And sometimes it's just about educating them. You know, I'm thinking back to our first supplier customer. This was like way back. <laughs> and I remember, you know, it's a director of marketing at a semiconductor company. And he was just like, can you like remind me, like, I know we had this call, but can you remind me what the value is of having this <laughs> content again? Like, can you remind me what this content is for and yeah, why we need it? Right. And like, he was like, you know, he's the director of a product line. Yeah. Like, yeah. At the semiconductor company. Right. And, and cause I think, so I think that like there's an education thing. Right. Cause they're thinking like, how, how does this help me sell more parts? Right. That's, I, I imagine mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's what they're getting judged on. So that any call with someone like Snappy Day would be like, how is this going to help me sell more parts? But it's, 
but it helps them sell so many yeah, I know, I know. Like, exactly. We've done- it seems so <laughs> obvious to us, but it's just like to them, it's just like, well, but how many eyeballs will get in front of it? It's like, it doesn't matter how many eyeballs. It's that one eyeball. It's the engineer eyeball. It's the, you know, I feel, yep. I feel like it's that thing where every single distributor, sales rep, FAE, everybody there, they come to me and they're telling me about a part three months too late. And in, the ones that are smart would think, hey, Snap EDA is there when I'm actually deciding, you know? And like some mm-hmm. of the distributors are doing that too. It's like the important time, what the time that matters for getting a, what do they call us? Winning a socket is not when the distributor decides to pop by and see if you can get lunch, if they even do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Definitely not for me. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's like when I'm doing a web search and like, oh yeah, that part looks good. I'll actually investigate it more or it's easy to get data or it's easy to get a sample circuit or something like that. Like that's, that's when this, this content is gold, I think. Absolutely. And like, I think the other thing too, that needs a little bit of just education too. I, I think it's that, you know, there's a difference between an engineer who knows the component that they want Mm -hmm. yep. and an engineer who is open to, you know, they're looking for something that suits their needs. Like there's a difference between someone Uh, saying, I want this particular sensor versus like, I want a sensor that meets these specs. Right. It's like browsing versus buying or whatever it is. Like the, the person who actually wants the salesperson to come up to them at the store and be like, do you need help something with something today? You know, like some people do actually want that. Mm -hmm. Well, and even just like, I think in terms of design wins, Mm -hmm. right? Like if we think of, for these component suppliers, what I think, you know, I think for them recognizing that this is a design win for them Mm -hmm. and it's not always a design win. So if this FAE comes and takes you out for lunch, Chris, and they sell you on a particular part, sure, okay? And then they come to Snap EDA and they download that part. Well, that's not like a design win. Like the FAE won that, right? Yeah. But if you come straight to Snap EDA... And you're like, oh, I want like, you know, a connector that has like 60 pins, 2.54 millimeter pitch. And then we like recommend one, you know, from a supplier and you download that, you use it in your design. That's a design win. Yeah, totally. And so I think there's just like, I think just like education of, you know, educating the market on on these different things is just, I think once it clicks for them and once they recognize it, they're like, oh man, like we need to, we need to do everything we can to support engineers. We need to do everything we can to, to get them this content. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that's kind of underlying the surface here is it is cutting out some of their traditional sales channels. And those sales channels are incredibly resistant to change because there's a ton of money tied up in there. I mean, like when an FAE comes by and buys me lunch, it's not because they like me so much. It's because there is some, (laughs) you know, payoff in the end if I do design in a chip there. And that's why mm-hmm. they don't buy me lunch anymore because I, I don't have the buying power anymore. But like, like yeah, that that is, that's like the inherent part of the system. So does that mean that Snappy EDA is going to start killing things like component registrations? Because I don't know if I've mentioned that on the show, but I'm sure I've mentioned mm-hmm. that on the show before, but that is an insane system in my opinion. It's insane. And, you know, we're not here to disrupt any industries. Like that's not what we're here to do. Like what we're here to do is, you know, we're, what we're here to do is basically you know, looking at that industry and that whole process, it's so inefficient and it's so archaic. That being said, there are certain components that are very complex that need a lot of assistance, sure. right? And yeah. we're not here to say like, we're going to like solve that, right? What I will say is that we're another channel that's a lot more cost effective, like, you know, magnitudes, orders of magnitude more efficient, like than flying over to another city and like, right. you know, renting a car right. and driving to an office and taking Chris out to lunch. In, in the times of COVID, specifically, it's, it's offset <laughs> very well, I'm sure. Oh, in times of COVID, we've had people, you know, reaching out for, for this exact reason. They're like, we can't sell the traditional way we used to sell. We need to evolve. We need to change. And so I think that this has kind of been a forcing function, the whole pandemic situation where they can't do that anymore. But on top of that, I think they're starting to realize like, yeah, that wasn't very efficient. So <laughs> I always think there's, you know, I always think there's going to be a place for that, mm-hmm. right? Because these really large deals, like you're not going to land, you know, Apple, you're, you you know, you need to have that human touch, right? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. But I, sure. I definitely think for the long tail and 80% of like in design ends, like I definitely think that a, a system like ours, obviously it's a lot more efficient and obviously there's just a lot more insights that we can, we can draw about how they're selecting parts and using data. And we can kind of bring this into, you know, the modern day age. So yeah, you know, that's, that's definitely what we'd like to do. And I think that's win-win for everybody because what this means for engineers is 
these companies operate more efficiently, which means that hopefully can also be reflected in the cost or through investment in other types of content. And of course, the only way that an engineer can discover components on our website is if it has content available. Yeah, right. If it has the symbol and footprint, it gets boosted. If it has free samples, it gets boosted. Oh, I didn't I didn't know that's a thing. That's a thing. Yeah, we have free samples on our site as well. Ah. Our whole idea is that like the more we can like make it win-win between suppliers, engineers, and Snappy DA, like the more we're all gonna win. We really look at it as like everything we do has to line up. It has to be like ultimately be for the engineer. Like we'll never do anything for suppliers that is gonna jeopardize an engineer's ability to get their design done. So we always put the engineer engineer first. Yeah, that's good to know. I mean, so you do have analytics on the other side. I'm curious, just kind of uh, maybe if you can put your your former technology contributor Forbes and uh, Reuters <laughs> writer hat on. So what are what are some trends that you see? Obviously, you see a ton of data coming through. You see how engineers are searching for parts, finding parts. Do you have any like broad trends or do you publish any broad trends anywhere? That's a good question. We do publish some trends on our, on our Snap Insights blog, which is kind of like a blog for suppliers. In terms of trends, I can't really think of anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> I could probably send you stuff after. That's okay. I mean, yeah, no, that's okay. I, I, I should have asked you that beforehand. Yeah, no, I, that's the kind of, actually, yeah. like from a, I'm, I'm, I think, well, you and I talked about this before the episode started as well. Like I'm, I'm very interested in like the popular parts. <laughs> not in like a not in like a high school mm-hmm. clicky kind of way, but like in a you know like I'll go to like an LCSC and I'll go and find what's the most you know what's the what's the part on there that is big in the the Chinese ecosystem or what's available you know online mm-hmm. in the Chinese ecosystem just because I want to see what is going to be high volume and I, I use that as like an approximation for low risk and like so like that kind mm-hmm. of thing is interesting to me same kind of thing like to give an example of a you know silicon example between an NRF fifty two part family, what is the one that's most popular and most likely to stick around? And that could be the footprint variant or the even the the functional features that are available on a thing. If I have a pretty loose spec for myself, then I'm going to go towards popularity. And, and that's always something mm-hmm. that I try to find, but it's hard to it's hard to draw that out because that's not something that they want to publish. And I can imagine the same thing if I go to a DigiKey, they don't want to show that like, oh, everybody buys this one TI part because it's cheap and it's you know readily available. But I want to see that. So how do I see that? <laughs> yeah, that's a really awesome idea. Like we don't, today what we do is we show like the number of downloads. So you could absolutely open like multiple variants of the mm. component and look at how many times it was downloaded, yeah. which is a really good proxy for that. But I love the idea of like ranking them. You know, yeah. it's not something we do today. We do have like, there's a few categories we show like, oh, these are the top like DC DC converters or yeah. these are the top amplifiers. But mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's a really, really cool idea. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so when I was working on like like fine chips and parts IO when I was at Supply Frame, that's one thing we 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 did like a risk rank and all this, you know, like a name for it, or whatever. And it was kind of popularity mm-hmm. based for the the data we had. And but like at the end of the day, that's all I want to know is I just want to know, you know, when when there is a jelly bean component, I want someone to put a line in the sand and just say, oh yeah, this is the one. You know, like but that's that's really hard to do mm-hmm. because obviously the industry is gigantic, like you said, a billion parts and tons of variation between them. So I don't know. I just, I just wanted, I just wanted an answer, Natasha. You know. <laughs> well, you're right, though. It's like an, it's, it's the eighty twenty rule, right? Yeah, like, so, yeah. like, yeah. I mean, you'll definitely see that twenty percent of parts dominate eighty percent of the downloads. Mm-hmm. So, I think what you're asking for is totally solvable. Like, I could absolutely go into our backend analytics and like pull that for you in like two minutes. Cool. So, cool. I definitely think surfacing that for, yeah, for engineers. I, I love that idea. It's definitely something that talk to my team about it. I think that's great. Coming soon, the Amp Hour Snap EDA report. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> that was the NFL theme. That I didn't sing an NFL theme there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I would have known, I would have absolutely brought that. Yeah, um, I bad. can send, you know, I can send it to you after the, the meeting. I know it's, we've supplied it before to um, EE Times mm-hmm. and to some other, yeah, press. So I'd, I'd be happy to send that over and it might be interesting for, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, that's great. That's great. I mean, so you do, and you do have an analytics side of things, but that's actually more for the chip companies. Is that right? It is, yeah. yeah. So we give them aggregated analytics. These are your your top 10 most pop, you know, popular products mm-hmm. or 
these are the keywords that engineers use to discover your parts, yeah, or these yeah. are the countries that engineers downloaded in. Right. So yeah, we give them aggregated insights mm-hmm. through there. Yeah, that's great. I mean, and that's the thing. Like, it, it does. It is very symbiotic, right? I, one part of me kind of bristles at the idea of like data being shared by that, but then I think the logical brain's mm-hmm. like, yeah, but if they get that data, they're going to make more parts you like, Chris. You know, like that's that's at the end of the day, it's like it's going to make better parts, better delivery, better supply availability, that sort of thing. So that's actually really great. We don't share any personal information with the suppliers. Yeah, exactly. That too. Yeah, I'm right. Then, like I said, it's it's lizard brain versus logical brain there. And once logical brain takes over, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and what I will say is like, I, I think that in the industry, a lot of, you know, one of the things that we have not done from the beginning is we do not share personal data mm-hmm. with yep. suppliers. And I think that's something that's really unique about us. We've gotten a lot of pressure from suppliers oh, because, totally. yeah. you know, that's the easy way for them to see the value in mm-hmm. us, yep. right? Is, oh, I just want the contact information. <laughs> yep. yep. It might not be the most valuable thing that we provide, right. Right? right? In the long run, obviously design wins a lot more valuable, but for them, it's like the instant gratification of like, oh, we fulfilled our lead goal for the quarter. Yeah. I know it's, it is, it's these like, it's these like these lopsided like systems of like, especially if you're working with marketing departments, they just need number of leads and then they're going to span the crap out of that lead. And then it's like, okay, well that look what that did. Yep. (laughs) It's like, it's like, yeah, it's like ruining goodwill too. I don't know. It's yeah, it's, I think it's just a lopsided reward system, unfortunately. Totally. And well, I mean, it comes down to, you know, short term versus long term Mm -hmm. value. And I think that like, it's, it's easy to jump at like, oh, this is the short term. Both both for us, I mean, that would be like an easy thing for us to sell, right? Mm-hmm. Is just be like, oh, we're going to sell all the contact information and what they downloaded, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's not something we do. And we've never done that. And I think that we, yeah, well, we've had so much pressure from suppliers and we've stayed firm because that's good. what they say to us is like, you know, all these other library solutions are doing it. Like, why aren't you guys <laughs> doing this? And <laughs> Talk about high school click right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, totally. They're just like, let us give you some advice. Oh, yeah, right, right. It's definitely been like we've had to stand our ground. But yeah, you know, the data that we provide is all anonymized. And it's literally just, it's like going into Google Analytics. Mm-hmm. That is the best analogy mm-hmm. because think of our search engine. It's like organic searches, like Google's organic searches. We have our promoted parts, kind of like Google Ads. Yeah. And yeah. then we have the analytics dashboard that is just like Google Analytics, which gives you the high level insights. But we don't give IP. We don't give any personal information in there. Yeah. Where are people coming from? So I mentioned that SnappyD is on DigiKey now. That's how I see it a lot. Uh, obviously, Google results, people search on the site. What, what would you say is the how most people are using it? Do, do most people do you find are using actual SnappyDA.com? Most, I would say it's about 40% of people that oh, come wow. direct to us. Yeah, that's great. Or so. It's a big chunk that come through search, mm-hmm. maybe 30%. And then, you know, the rest are referrals. I think di- distributors in total make up ten, about 10% okay. of cool. our traffic. Where where else would people see you? I mean, it's distributor sites and uh, like within like, uh, is it within any CAD programs or anything like that? Yes, it isn't within CAD programs. So, oh, cool. Yeah. So we have ex- uh, Express PCB. We have PCB123. That's the JLC one? Is that the Express PCB or no? Uh, no. So Express PCB is... They're owned by uh, Sunstone. That's oh, their tool. That's it. So Sorry. PCB123. Yep. 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 There's Proteus. Mm-hmm. And we're working on a few more that are native. We also have like plugins in those tools. So mm-hmm. for Altium, for KeyCAD that we built. And then, yeah, we have a bunch that are coming soon as well. So that's the other way. Awesome. Yeah. And we have some new products that are going to provide new ways. But I'd say the biggest ones are people coming straight to our website or or through Google. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that's great. And I mean, and one of the benefits of the site too, is that there's tools on there like the InstaBuild, which is like a new tool. What is, what is that thing? So InstaBuild is a computer vision based schematic symbol builder. Uh, so the idea is that, well, if you go on there, basically you can highlight the pin table in a, in a data sheet. Mm-hmm. And what it does is a little, it uses OCR, optical character recognition and computer vision simple computer vision to detect, to detect the table mm-hmm. and lines. And what it does is it extracts the information from the table. And then what we do is we can, you know, detect, is this an input? Is it an output? Is it a power pin? And, you know, we try our best to detect what it is and categorize the pin appropriately. Got it. And then you as an engineer can go in and make any tweaks you want to the pin, pin designations. From there, we use those pin designations to automate the symbol configuration knowing that a lot of our engineer 
engineering community likes a logical flow of symbols, right? So yeah, inputs right. on the left, outputs on the right. We then automate the symbol based on that and attach it to an IPC compliant footprint. So long story short, what this tool does is within like two minutes, you can build a symbol and footprint for your for your design just by highlighting the, the pin table, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so great. it's something engineers really like, and yeah, it's it's fun to use too. Yeah, the the only thing that was weird about it is like it, I, I used it once, and then it says like, oh, this is only so this is only available for me, right? So it's like a custom mm-hmm. per time thing. Like, uh, mm-hmm. if I go and use it for one part, I, I expected it was going to be more broadly available after that, like building out the database, but that's not the case. No, so well, it's definitely something. So I mean, it's definitely something that we've consider doing. Mm -hmm. But um, what we realized is that a lot of times the data that's generated because it's user generated content, Mm -hmm. it is a little bit risky. So what we do is we only make it available to the person that built it. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that engineers actually are happy about that just because the data is, you know, it's definitely hasn't gone through any vetting. That being said, our long-term plan is, so what we're planning to do is we're planning to, you know, just say five different people build the same symbol. Oh, yeah. Then yeah. our plan is to say, okay, is the pin mapping consistent? Mm-hmm. Are the pin designations consistent? If or or you know, correct in eighty percent of the cases, yeah, right? Right. You start to do like uh, SPC almost on on a particular part, kind of generate exactly. Yeah, that's our long term plan. So it's definitely something we're we're planning to expand really soon. The original goal was absolutely like, okay, let's use this to kind of you know build out our library further. But you know, we we also it's always a trade off between building our library really quickly and potentially introducing errors. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And like you said, you have to build the trust, you've built the trust and people have switched over to thinking about snappy DA in a positive way now. So you wouldn't want to ruin that. So that's, that's smart. Yeah. But you know, it, you make a good point. So it's definitely something we want to, we just, we just want to do it right when we release it. So yeah, we've had some people on like, I know on YouTube, like wondering why their parts weren't showing up Mm -hmm. and, but yeah, we've done a lot of surveys and what we found is that, people really appreciate that it's only available to them, like other people. Other people are happy that that data is in our system. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And, you know, and th- another thing too is sometimes when people use it, they they don't know how to use it. They don't recognize that like that's going to show up on the site. And like, I think that, yeah, we just want to make sure we do it right if we if we release it to the public. That's great. That's great. Uh, last question on the analytics side of thing. I'm curious about like the split that you see on the export kind of thing. So it, you get kind of an mm-hmm. ad hoc view of the CAD landscape as well, or at least the CAD landscape of people that are using it, Snap EDA, using web tools in general. Do you have like percentages on what the exports look like? Yeah. So Altium is absolutely like the number one. Yep. Altium is number one. And then it's next is Eagle. Mm-hmm. Orcad and Allegro and KeyCat are kind of tied. Mm-hmm. Those are probably like each. So I think like, you know, Altium is probably like 30%. Eagle is probably like 25%. I'm guessing KeyCAD, Orcad, and Allegro are probably like 15% each. Okay. And then it kind of goes down to the rest, like, you know, mentor pads and some of the other tools. You got some old ones on there, like, well, maybe not old. I, I just don't, I don't recognize them. Like Target 3001. I don't know that one. Yeah. Target 3001, we just introduced. Mm. So they're in the UK. Mm-hmm. And I believe they're in the UK or, or, or somewhere in Europe. Okay. And yeah, so they're like, they're, they're a, yeah, they're a totally an active tool and mm. they have a, a community and, you know, you'd be surprised how many <laughs> PCB design tools are out there. Oh yeah, exactly. And if you, and if, especially because you're building an exporter too, it's like, once you put that, you hook, you put the hooks in place, it's like you basically open up an entirely new net market segment, especially one that's probably going to be very, yes. very thankful that they're like, oh, someone cares about us <laughs> instead of being like, yep. we have to go and create all this stuff from scratch now. You know, like that, that sucks. That's, that's the pain of library management. To your point, though, there's, you know, going back to the 80-20 rule, it's definitely dominated by, you know, (laughs) by a few major players. Mm -hmm. So I think there's kind of diminishing returns once we start expanding. We obviously want to support everyone that Mm -hmm. we can. That's part of our mission. We're going to absolutely keep expanding to more, even if they have smaller kind of communities. But, you know, 80-20 rule is absolutely at play here where 80% of engineers are using Altium, Cadence products, KeyCAD. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, Autodesk, like the, the big players you know, and Eagle, stuff like Fusion. that. Yeah, that's great. Yep. Cool. Oh, that's really good. That's really good to know. I'm, I'm curious too, because like the, it seems like some of the tools, like, so like Altium has some capabilities on internally as well to, to like, obviously there's the, the, the Snap EDA plugin, but then there's also like some mm-hmm. internal libraries that are available, right? 
Yeah. So they have, I think they have like their own search kind of capabilities, mm-hmm. I think with Altium 365. Ah, right. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's like a new, yeah, it's a new, a newer, newish offering, not new, but like, uh, yeah, that's subscription service they have, right? Mm-hmm. There's just so many components out there, mm-hmm. right? And I think it comes down to like core competency. Mm-hmm. What is the core competency of the company? And, you know, at Snappy Gay, we've kind of taken this bet that like this problem deserves focused attention by, right. you know, it's enough to be a company, right? And I think that like anytime, I think that the reason why Altium is such a big part of our user base is because it's just really difficult for any company to solve so many problems at once, you mm-hmm. know, and, you know, for them to build up this massive database. And I think they have a lot of great different, you know, companies that they've now acquired and things like that. But I think regardless, it's it's challenging. It's challenging for one company to tackle that. And and we've kind of taken this bet that like there's a large challenge here with content yeah. in in design tools that the EDA tools can't solve themselves. I mean, I used to work on the inside of an EDA tool. So I know the challenges that EDA tools have, you know, uh, in terms of R&D and bandwidth and things like that. And uh, yeah, they're all sm- small teams to start with. And if you're focused on the actual like making the, the core tool better, the data becomes like the secondary concern. Maybe as mm-hmm. at least, yeah, again, like the the lopsided reward systems, you know, like the, the tool system or the tool maker is going to make sure the tool is the best thing it, it, it can be. It doesn't, they don't care about the data, especially over time, I would imagine. Right. Exactly. I mean, I think that Altium is a different kind of company, right? Like I think Altium special mm-hmm. <laughs> in the landscape of companies. I think that they are obviously, you know, pursuing a different strategy where for them data is more important, right? If you look at content in general, that Altium is doing a fantastic job with that, so I have so much respect for them and I think they're incredible, but I also think that like engineers deserve a company that's like really focused in on this, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Because I think there's just so much opportunity and there's so much that, that these large EDA companies can't do, even if they want to have a strategy that pursues content and things like that. You know, I think ultimately they'll need to work with other players in the space to help them with that. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, what else should people keep an eye on uh, with Snap EDA in the, in the near term? What should, or maybe, and then also, how can they, how can people get started with it right now? Sure. So we are launching some really cool things in the next month or so. Um, we have, I think, two particular launches that I'm super excited about. So stay tuned and <laughs> keep an eye on our Twitter channel. I guess you could say. But one is just something that I'm just like, I've just been pumped about for a while. So keep in, keep your keep your ears and your eyes and ears open for that. Okay. Um, but I think in terms of how to get started, SnapEDA is totally free. Uh, engineers can go to www.snapeda.com to, to get started. And yeah, I mean, it's super easy to use. You just basically create a free account. You can start searching for, you know, a part that you need for your design, download it, and then import it into your design. If you're using our plugins... You don't even need to import. You can place directly from from the EDA tools. So, you know, in KiCad, uh, you can just search and then place or search and add to library. Yeah. So, yeah, it should be pretty intuitive. And, yeah, I hope people give it a try. And, and yeah. And, you know, I think the one other thing I'd like to say, too, is that our team is so, so focused on building a great tool for engineers. And they're building it. Like, we're all building it for the right reasons. We truly believe that the industry needs this and we want to help, you know? And I think that sometimes what people don't realize is we have incredible technical support. Mm. We have people that are doing technical support all day (laughs) and like they are here to help. They're engineers. They're very skilled. They are very experienced and we want to help engineers. So if a library, you know, if you are, you know, you download a library and you're like, hey, this doesn't look like the rest of my, you know, the symbols in my keycad library or... I'm not sure how this slotted hole is defined. I I, I don't understand, yeah. you know, why this is defined on this particular layer. You want to like dig in, dig into the uh, into the nitty gritty with the with the the engineer behind it. it. Sounds like you can people the people listening here can get in touch with them. Yeah, like we're here to support you. If you ever find issues, like we're here for you. Like right. we want we want to make sure that Snap EDA is the place that we're always iterating, we're always improving, we're always pushing the boundaries. You know, and you know we can't do this in a void, right? So I think that like, that's something I want to also share is like, please share your feedback. If you guys have feedback for us, whether it's good or bad, like, please share it with us because that's the way we keep improving. And what I can tell you is that 
we go through every single piece of feedback. Mm. With our annual survey, we had over 2,000 responses. Wow. And we went through every single re- response. That's great. Every single one. And we use that to define our roadmap as like one of the inputs. So I just want people to know that because sometimes like I notice that people will ask questions on forums that they could just come to us and probably get the answer, mm. you know, like definitely use the forums. That's totally fine. But, you know, we're here for you. So I, I just wanted to share that with everyone. What's 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 the best way to to push that feedback to Snappy Day? So we have an intercom chat in like the, you know, bottom right hand corner. A little the little chat bubble. Yep, chat bubble. Um, we also answer, you know, support at snappy.eda.com. There's also on every single part page, you can report issues. Ah, that's great. We have people that are constantly going through those. So, you know, we have people who, for example, maybe they are using an older version of the EDA tool and they can't import it or whatever. And like mm-hmm. someone will be there to assist you. Great. So yeah, I just wanted to let people know that we have like multiple channels. And, you know, if we don't know, like if there is something we don't support and that you guys really want, like if we don't know about that, then we only can do so much as we know, you know? Mm -hmm, And we do have a team that obviously, you know, lots of PCB designers on our team, but no one knows the tools better than the people that are working on them day in and day out, which is all the PCB designers out there. So, you know, if you guys are like, hey, like, you know, I noticed that, this silk screen width is like inconsistent with the silk screen width in KiCad mm, in the native yeah, libraries. Yeah. Like, please share that with us. We can update our exporter. You know, we can look into that. But again, if like people aren't complaining to us enough, like, or not enough, but if they don't <laughs> no, come no, to no, us no, directly. No, you said complain. If people are going to complain, Natasha, they, you're going to get it. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. and like, you know, and we're good with that, you know? It's a valuable feedback is what you're looking for, it sounds like. Yeah. Valuable feedback. You know, like, I mean, you know, complaints are fine too. Honestly, like I get it. I, I use a lot of tools on the web and you know, I'm i uh, I'm an electrical engineer who I also like, I want things to work. I want things. I have high, you know, I have a high standard. She's, of she's saying she's grumpy too. That's what she's, that's what I, that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> it's great. Another, I am grumpy, grumpy, you know, grumpy, I am grumpy engineer expect- builds tools for grumpy engineers. That, that's, that's, that's what we want. That's what, that's all we've ever wanted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am grumpy because, and, and I get it, you know, yeah. PCB design, there's so many details and I get it, you know, maybe try to be a little bit nice. There are people at the end of, you know, the support channels. That, oh yeah. Yeah. There are humans there, right? It's not, it's not, not some AI bot. <laughs> there's humans there that aren't me. Like this is their job and, you know, <laughs> so yeah. be nice, but like, you know, please, please be vocal. And, you know, and, and I think that like, I just want everyone to know that because I, you know, I think that on our team, like we truly have a team that is so committed to building something great for engineers. And it's so much more than just making money mm-hmm. because if it was just about that, we would be selling leads all over the place right. and That's selling right. contact yeah. information. Like, That's right. Like we would have done that years ago, yep. but we, we truly are doing this because we care about our community. We care about engineers and we care about solving this problem and moving the world closer to our vision, which is how do we break down barriers for engineers? And, you know, we have a long way to go. We're not perfect. There's things that, you know, we know we need to solve, right? And there's things we know we need to do. Every day we wake up and we're focused on the things that we know our community cares about. So please do reach out and, uh, I think that's basically it for me. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Natasha. We'll uh, we'll definitely have links for everything, and uh, hopefully that re- we'll we'll t- you and I will talk after this about the maybe having a report uh, on the back end that uh, we can pull into into the show notes and, and things like that. So please, people can check out the show notes and check out snappyda.com. Thanks so much for joining us, Natasha. We're looking forward to seeing more fun things from Snappy Da here soon. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for having me. Today's engineering content was made possible by the generous AmpHour community members at Patreon. Join us at patreon.com slash the You can share your latest footprints, symbols, and most importantly, opinions on our Discord.